Uh, it's my pleasure tonight to uh, introduce you to Donna Lassiter, who will be turning on her screen share now as I do the introduction. Okay. Lassiter okay. serves on the board of Sawmill River Audubon, where she manages uh, our butterfly, hummingbird, and meadow demonstration gardens, and Prime Sanctuary in Chappaqua. She is a master gardener with the Cornell Extension of Westchester, where she mentors the creation and maintenance of native plant, school, and community gardens. She's committed to promoting a healthy environment, and she grows over 90 species of native plants in her home gardens. So I'm delighted tonight uh, to welcome uh, Donna Lassiter. Thank you, Donna. Well, thank you very much. The concept of this garden, which I'm going to show you, this isn't the garden yet, is uh, showing meadow plants for lawn replacement for homeowners. So how did it get started? Well, it was put in in 2018, and it's going to be in its fourth growing season this year. Um, Salma River Audubon got an opportunity for a Plants for Birds grant from National Audubon. Um, requirements were to show a bird-friendly habitat, one, installed that same spring, which was very interesting, because I think it was late January, early February before we got the approval. Um, and um, then we showed the garden, we were intending to show the garden August, uh, I'm sorry, July, August, and September that same year. So it was really, really a crunch. But we did the design first and then we you know, tested the soil and got it all done that year. So um, we, have, we have a meadow, a a, not a beautiful meadow, a very weedy meadow at the Prine Sanctuary. Would have been great to have renovated that meadow, but you can't prepare a meadow in one, you know, one season, much less uh, just in the spring. So we also had a very huge lawn and we decided that we would do a garden that showed simple meadow plant combinations, 10 of them, for homeowners to choose as lawn replacement. And the um, part, of, a lot of the inspiration uh, for the meadow came from the High Lawn, which I used to visit all the time, uh, driving in from up here, visiting friends in New York City. Um, they have a marvelous meadow, mostly native, but not all native. So this is the plan. This is when we laid it out. Uh, it's organized into two planting areas, uh, each eight feet wide by 40 feet long. And down the center is a path. So we tried to sort of, you know, it, it's, it's sort of like walking through a meadow, a path in the middle of a meadow. And each side has five sections. So there are 10 sections total, total. And each section shows one native meadow grass and about three native perennials, meadow perennials. That, I thought would grow well with that grass, and I'll tell you how I came to those conclusions. So the plant combinations I want to show you, these are the 10 plant combinations that I came up with after we decided upon this, this garden. Uh, I'm gonna go through these quickly because these are slides from the internet, a lot of them, some of them are from other gardens, but most are from the internet. And later in the presentation, I want to have enough time to show you the real garden and the plants in it and talk about them. So this is going to go quickly. So this is area A1, which is a little blue stem plant combination. Um, this is the design phase. So, you know, these are not actual prime photos yet. Uh, and these are, will be, I'm going to show you each of the 10 plant combinations. Uh, the way I designed it, and I don't know if anybody else would ever want to do this, but I think it's a really good way. I make uh, PowerPoint collages, like the one you see on the screen. And I made one of these for each 8x8 area with the plants that I liked. Just for, for, just for one area, as if someone was going to just put that in alone. And then, um, then you know, the 10 of them, when I got all 10 of them done, I just put them in the garden and then drew up a plan. So I researched the grasses first. This is little blue stem. And what I really found was about the grasses, I was really amazed. I thought of native grasses before that, I'd never grown any. I thought of them as, you know, green, pretty tall and green, and then, you know, they die back in the winter. Well, I found them going through the seasons, each one of them with several phases. And each phase was really quite, uh, quite beautiful and different. For, for little blue stem, you know, at the bottom you see the spring foliage. The summer foliage is similar, but it has little flowers on top. So it has a different texture in the summer. 
In the fall, it turns pinkish. Now, sometimes this pink and sometimes less than this pink, but it turns pinkish. And then finally, late fall, it turns golden orange with a, with a silvery wheat color. All of the native grasses you see, I'm not going to go through all of them, and they are on the, the sawmill website. So you'll, you'll um, at, or, at, or on the presentation that you'll get a copy of. But all of them have this kind of, uh, through the seasons, kind of changing look. And so I was really very inspired by them. Um, so this plant combination was inspired by my gardens at home. That's the picture in the upper left. Uh, I gr I've grown this combination and I liked it. So that's how this one came, came to be. Area A2, prairie drop seed. Um, this was inspired by the high line of the two pictures on the left. <clears throat> um, it's, uh, the grass is, is, um, is, is really a beautiful grass that waves in the breeze, as you can see. And so um, that's, that's what inspired this. Also in, in these pictures are, going with it, orange cone flower, purple cone flower, prairie blazing star, New England aster, Joe Pye weed. Third plant combination, big blue stem black hops. This is a cultivar of big blue stem. Again, inspired by the high line, which is on the, the picture is lower left. Another reason that I like to look at the high line, um, and I also look at prairie nursery, was plant combinations that would grow well together. If I see this at the high line growing beautifully, um, then I know, you know, that I, that, you know, I could do this, and it would grow, they would they would interplant nicely and grow well together. Uh, so this one has. Um, wild quinine, black-eyed Susan, threadleaf blue star, and butterfly weed. And the grass you'll see later, that um, cultivar, black hops, really does turn purple. Area A4, big blue stem. This is the species of blue stem. So this area is, a, is big blue stem, and this is the straight species, which is very tall. It's about six feet high or so. Uh, it's very good, I've learned, to interplant with meadow flowers that like some support. Uh, but this was planned, I didn't know that then, this was planned with mountain mint, thirdly blue star, blue star, and yellow cone flower. Area A5 is side oats grandma. Okay, this is an interesting little grass. It has a spiky look to it, and uh, it's put in with butterfly weed, weed threadleaf blue star, orange cone flower, and false aster. Now we're going to see these plants again. But these are just the combinations together. On the other side, the left uh, area of garden is northern sea oats plant combination. Uh, and this is one of my very favorite. Um, with northern sea oats, mist flower, anise hyssop, and New England aster. Switchgrass. Uh, this is the species, switchgrass, which is a tall grass. You'll see it later in the photographs of the garden. <clears throat> and um, it's with common milkweed and orange cone flower. Very, very simple combination, but it's really effective. You'll see it later. Uh, area B3, switchgrass Shenandoah and Cape Breeze. Now, <clears throat> interestingly enough, this is inspired by the high line, as you can see on the left. But what is interesting is that this is the only plant I have never found in the garden over the years. I can't find it. It's either not turning red or it's looking just like something else. I don't know. The Shenandoah, I don't find. Uh, there's, no, there's no empty space, but it's just not there. But the Cape Breeze is down at the bottom left. That is a magnificent plant. Uh, it's a shorter plant. It's just like the species, but it is shorter. And so it can be used in smaller gardens. It's been the real star of the show. Pink hair grass. Um, some interesting foliage plants to complement the airy clouds of hair grass. A big contrast in foliage. Uh, it's with smooth aster, pale purple coneflower, and rattlesnake master. And B5, Indian grass. With wild senna, rough goldenrod fireworks, and joe pie weed again.
installation. Two thousand eighteen, May twelfth. Um, you can see how we laid it out. Saw that before. What we did is start with a patch of suburban lawn. We removed the sod. We rototilled to nine inches and added one third compost. We added leaf mold compost <clears throat> from Chappaqua. The um, what happened was the garden was designed in February, early February. We had to order the plants. When spring came around and I dug in, I found that some of the plants did not, the soil was very clay, much more clay than I had thought. And some of the plants I knew wouldn't like that. They didn't want to clay soil. Now, in a regular meadow, a real meadow that you, you know, like seed in, um, you would choose plants best suited to the soil. But this is a demonstration garden. And we wanted to show people all kinds of plants. If you've got clay soil, if you've got lumpy soil, etc. So we decided to add compost. And um, <clears throat> this brings me to a, a, uh, an issue or a, a discussion, which um, is an interesting one. Uh, typically, you wouldn't add, it's, it's not advised that you add compost to a meadow to a real meadow. We added it to this meadow garden for two reasons. One, <clears throat> we wanted to grow some plants that would grow best in loam. But second, this is compost. This is leaf mold compost. Our meadows up in New York State are born out of forests. The only time that we ever had a meadow, had meadows up here before everything was uh, built up, was when there was a, a blowdown or a fire. So that meadow was, a, was forest soil, which is incredibly deep, loamy, composty soil. And that's very different than fertilizer. So our meadow soils up here were, were rich in that way. And so I didn't have any qualms about this. Um, second point I just want to make is that this is not a real meadow. Obviously, it's a meadow garden. It's grown like a garden. You plant little plants, you know where each species is located, and you take care of this like any other garden of perennials. And it's a lot easier than, than growing a meadow, uh, according to everything that I know. I've never grown a meadow. But uh, on the prairie, there's a, there's a, there is a um, plant nursery, prairie nursery, within the Midwest, the great nursery. Um, they grow, they sell only native plants. Uh, and they also have a very good um, explanation of how to grow a real meadow. And if you look at that, you'll find that pretty complicated and more difficult than growing this. This is, a, this is an easy way to, to have a meadow effect without, in terms of pollinators and, and the environment without actually doing a real meadow. So then what we did, we leveled the beds and then we used vermiculite to outline the planting areas. I had made up a plan of the plants and, you know, on a piece of paper. And then I transferred it to the soil. And on the second planting day, first planting day, we prepared the, the garden. The second planting day, we put a yellow flag in each planting area with the name of the plant that went in there and the number of them. Then we labeled every plant with a little white label. We put a, you know, one of those little white labels into every single plant that we planted in, in a little pot. So that when all of the volunteers we had planted stuff in, the label got planted right next to the plant. And we could check later to make sure that the plants really were where we thought they were. So it, it worked very well. It was a good system. We had a lot of fun. And you can see these, uh, the plants that we planted, they were plug size. They were not uh, big plants from from a from nursery. They weren't horticultural gallon size, as they call it. Uh, they were plug size. Uh, I think we're going to go, I want to show you some pictures of the gardens next, the first year gardens, but I think we have a, a little minute for questions. Uh, somebody wants to change part of their quote unquote lawn to a meadow. <clears throat> I don't actually know what's growing there. Should we let it grow to find out? No, because it'll go to seed. If you have a lawn, now this lawn that we, that we, we, we removed the sod with the sod cutter, 
and then we did the, we rototilled it and put compost in. If you remove your lawn with a sod cutter, it'll take off most of the seeds. And if you have a lawn that's kept short, it's, it's you know, this lawn is not a great lawn. It has all kinds of weed seeds in it and it, it, it's fine. Um, just quickly, the, I can answer the, the deer thing in one minute. Um, we, all of these plants that were chosen are deer resistant. They're listed as deer resistant. The grasses are actually very deer resistant. I can say the deer have always hated the grasses. Um, some of the perennials are very deer resistant and others are less so. So being a public garden, um, we didn't want a fence and I thought it would be fine, but then I had second thoughts. I thought, this is a public garden. People are going to be <laughs> visiting this garden all the time. And um, so we do spray the perennials once a week with deer spray. Some of them, I know which ones now the deer don't like. And then, especially in the spring, early in the spring, and then later in the summer, less and less and less and less until finally by late summer, we don't have to spray them at all. Okay, let's go on then. This is the garden the first year, and I think all that compost really paid off. All the, all the soil is, re is really good soil. So this is July 6th to 8th. This is, I mean, 6th, eight weeks after planting. And everything is a foot, two feet high. It's, it's really, uh, I was surprised. I thought we wouldn't have uh, much to show in that for, for that first open day, but we did. Uh, these are the textures. I took pictures of some individual plants, and again, I was very, very surprised that we had, it, it was just marvelous textures. Hardly anything was blooming yet, but the textures were wonderful. And the grasses, um, especially the grasses, added a different kind of texture. The perennials are like bold, broad textures, and the, the grasses are very fine and, and spiky, and they just, it, it, it makes a lot of textural interest in the garden, even when the flowers are not blooming. This is August, the first year. This is August, this is the right um, plot, the first year. And this is the left plot, the first year. This is on August 19th, a garden open day. What's very nice about this is that we had signs up showing the plant combinations and we had given out a plant list. And so people were actually walking around choosing plants with their gardens, which I was delighted to see. Uh, they weren't just walking through and looking. We had pollinators. These are all pictures of pollinators that I took. Lots of pollinators, pollinators that visited that first season, all different kinds. Um, I, many of these, I put the names on, on these slides, but to me, it's not important what they are unless they start eating something that I don't want them to. Most of these, and all of these actually, that I identified are uh, good pollinators, they're good, good insects. And lots of butterflies that visited. And monarch, but we got a buckeye, which I have seen before at the gardens before. Spice for swallowtail, hummingbird clearing moth, great spangled fritillary, orange sulfur, sulfur. And interesting, three different kinds of skippers. We had more kinds than that, but these are the ones I photographed. Um, the native grasses are meant to host skippers. They grow skipper butterflies. And during one of the garden open days, I don't remember which, somebody said, oh, you've got so many skippers. And I said, yeah, we grow native meadow grasses as well. And a lot of birds visited too. These are not photos from the garden, uh, but all of the good birders, which I am not, but all of the good birders at Sawmill uh, let me know what um, you know? What birds were visiting, and how we put them on a screen. We had lots of visiting. So this is September, October. The sun is now getting lower in the sky, and the fall asters are in bloom. The pink, the little pink things there are all the asters and the whitish thing. This is October again. And the garden is going rather fallish. It's fading. And honestly, in the fall, I'm always worried about that it's going to fall apart and look bad. It always turns. I'm 
them a lot of noise. Is somebody having? Does somebody yeah, have? Somebody, a somebody else needs to mute their microphone, please. Because yeah, there's a lot of noise. I'm still hearing it. I'll try to track it down, Donna. Okay, thanks. So, um, so uh, what I started to say is what I'm always worried about the garden going kind of yucky in the fall, and it never has. It, it goes magical instead. It really does. It's quite wonderful. They're proliferating, and the birds are gathering on those seedlings. This is after a couple of frosts. And we're waiting for winter. This is an example of, I'll put it in quotes, the messy garden. And uh, it's really beautiful to, to my eyes. So um, I think I'm going to skip the questions now because I don't have a lot of time to finish. And I want to spend plenty of time on the plants that are actually growing there. Can, can we uh, can we just slip in one question, please? Of course, of course. Uh, there's a question about what are the plants which have the longest staying power over the years? Maybe too early to answer that, yeah? Well, I'm going to tell you about some of them that I know, and I'll try to mention it when I come to those plants, because we're going to go through the plants now. That sounds great. There's also a question about weeding. We'll take that to the end, though, please, if you don't mind. That's a maintenance question. And I yeah, unless Val to wants to tackle that. But please continue, Donna. I think we should do that at the end because it could Sounds be good. Kind of like a discussion. <laughs> yep, go ahead. Okay. So, and this is a, an autumn picture of the garden from a distance. That's the first year card. So, now we go to Photos of the Plants 2019. I've put them into their groups uh, of... Um, of plant combinations. So we can kind of see how they really looked together. And also, by the way, uh, aside from these pictures, which you'll have uh, by email, uh, come to the garden <laughs> and take a look and decide what works together for you. you know? So this is the second year garden. These are all photos, actual photos from the second year garden that I took. So this is the little blue stem area. And it has Echinacea purpurea, which uh, turns out to be, it's a very prolific plant. It grew, I mean, we interplanted it with little blue stem and it overtook the little blue stem. So we're going to need to make, carve out an area now for the little blue stem in that area. I've seen a meadow, a, a picture of a meadow, um, Doug Telemies, I think, with lots of little blue stem and Echinacea in it. They grow well together, but in that meadow, there was a lot of little blue stem and not very much echinacea. So these were interplanted together and I think the little blue stem just never got enough sun. And the echinacea, as you can see, it's like four feet high. It's, it's, uh, it's very, very vigorous. Um, I grow echinacea purpurea, which is the, the species. I like it the best. It's very vigorous. Um, it does last over time because it seeds around and comes up uh, uh, each year in different places. And this stand has gotten bigger every year. It's not a long-lived plant, but it's, uh, most perennials are not, you know, they're not trees or shrubs. Um, the Eupatorium, up in the, well, there's in the center bottom and up at the right, upper right. It, this is Eupatorium fistulosum little joe. And um, it is the best little joe I've ever seen. It's the best Eupatorium. Uh, Joe pie weed I've ever seen. Um, it's smaller than the species, although it gets to be five feet high. It's very upright, very strong. The foliage is tight and it's just a, quite a quite a dense, beautiful plant. <laughs> and there are always pollinators all over it. Um, and that is a long-lived plant. Uh, we have the species of that plant in the butterfly garden. And it's been there since I've been in the garden and was planted before, maybe 10, 15 years ago. So that's a very long lived plant. Uh, New England Aster, bottom right, uh, in October bloom. It is seeding around this year. So in, this is in uh, 2020, this is this year, it's been seeding around. And the wild blue indigo, I don't have a photo of it. It's it's a very long-lived plant. It'll live longer than we are, than we do. But it 
takes its time to grow in. So it had a few flowers and seed heads this year, but it's very long lived and it's very reliable. The next combination is the prairie drop seed. We don't have a big enough area, as I mentioned, for this prairie drop seed. Um, we, we're going to carve out a little bigger area for it this year, but um, um, but you you really should have a good size, at least an eight by eight area maybe for it to, to show it up uh, at its best. Um, the Echinacea purpurea is a good contrast within the background. New England aster is a clump next to it. New England aster, not all asters, but New England aster gets what you call what you would call ugly legs. It's the one on the far left, the blue flower. Um, but its legs get bare and they they're not diseased. I mean they are diseased, but it's very typical for echinacea for the um, New England aster to do this. Um, so you want to face it down with another plant. Uh, put a plant in front of it that's uh, going to cover some of that up. It's only at the bottom. And the prairie blazing star. Uh, this has just an amazing form to it. Uh, ours needs staking. It should maybe be interplanted. I'm sure it would be in nature, interplanted with taller grasses that support it. So, um, but ours we usually stake. And I think as the garden also gets um, less um, less fertile each year, it'll, it, some of these things will will um, will get stiffer. This is the big blue stem area. Uh, the big blue stem is, I guess the best picture is on the upper right. It's tall and straight, six feet or so. And it's excellent to grow in, you know, taller metal, meadow flowers in it to give them support. We didn't. We put the, uh, the sweet black-eyed Susan in its own little clump ahead of it. And uh, sometimes it gets a little, we have to stake it up a bit. But if we had interplanted that in between, you know, really in between that big blue stem, it would be just like a, a real meadow and uh, it would be holding out better. Um, the big, oh, by the way, just wanted to mention the um, the prairie drop seed. I had a conversation with the head of prairie nursery a while back and he started mentioning things to me. Uh, one thing to pass on is that the prairie drop seed, he says is one of the longest lived grasses that you can imagine. I was concerned about grasses and, and how long they lived and what they did. He said they were all different. Some of them are short lived, some of them are long lived. And um, you just find out as you as you grow them. Um, wild quinine, it's a, a real favorite plant for me. It has huge sculptural leaves and early bloom. It begins, the bloom begins late June. So it's, it's uh, one of the early bloomers in the garden. And the mountain mint, I love it. It's very reliable. It has beautiful black bracked flowers. They're not, they're, the flowers are actually bracts, so they last for months. Um, it spreads vigorously by runners. This is the thing. In a garden like this, we wanted to put it in. We have runners that are running out from it, one foot, two feet, in some directions, all around its clump where it's supposed to be. We cut them off every spring and pull them out. So in a home garden, you might want to consider um putting it in, a, in in an area where you can confine it or where it can where it can really roam uh, over lots of area <clears throat> this is the big blue stem black hawks this is the cultivar of a, a cultivar of big blue stem um, it really does as you see these are all pictures in the garden get a beautiful purple and it gets better and better color as the as the season goes on. Um, big blue stem is also a very long lived plant, I'm told. So this means um, many years, 15 years, something like that for a perennial. Uh, orange coneflower is in this combination. It's common, but it's absolutely perfect. It looks very uh, casual and very um, natural. And I really like it. We had a problem with it one year, and we're going to try it back again this year. Uh, it's normally fine, no problem, but I think we had a very rich soil the first year. We had a lot of, um, a lot of, um, a lot of rain, 
and early season, and it grew together very closely that year. So um, it got a fungus, and we had to pull it out. We tried, I tried to find uh, some substitutes, but I, I have not found a substitute. Uh, the substitute looks very artificial, so I'm not even going to mention it. False aster is the other part of this combination. Um, it hasn't lasted over the winter very well, and we bought it again to try again. Maybe it'll do better now. Um, the, the deer at Prime love it, um, but I spray many of the perennials, you know, as I mentioned, but not the grasses. Side oats grandma. Okay, this is an interesting one. It has a very spiky look to it, as you saw in the plant combination photos from the internet, but this doesn't have the same form. It's rather messy. However, um, Ann Swain, our executive director, who you know now, um, he loved, she loves its messiness. She says it has a wild look about it, and I've actually gotten to like it too, and I mix, it's being mixed with a butterfly weed, so it's, the two together are quite quite stunning. It is supposed to be rather short lived, however, I'm told by Prairie Nursery, but you know, we'll just um, divide it or replace it when, when that happens. The Northern Sea Oats area. The Northern Sea Oats is in the next picture. I could, don't have a picture of it, all of it. But uh, this is really one of my favorite plant combinations. Uh, it grows with here Anis hyssop, which is the tall, purpley, spiky, spiky thing, always covered with bees, one of the greatest nectar plants. It sometimes comes through the winter for us and sometimes doesn't. Some websites and people say it's long lived, some people say it's short lived. It's just too good of a nectar plant. And um, we grow it every year and sometimes it comes up like gangbusters and other years we, uh, we get a little more and put some more in. Mist flower, that's the one in the front left of the picture. Uh, it's very reliable and pollinators are always all over, all kinds of pollinators. It expands by roots quite a bit, but unlike other things, you can pull it out. You just take your hand, it might go out, spread out about six inches beyond where it's, where it's growing. And you just take your hand in the spring when you do spring cleanup and you just pull it out along the edge and then it's fine. It's no trouble at all. And it is to me an essential plant. And then of course the orange cone flower again. There are two kinds. There's uh, Goldstrom, which is a shorter uh, cultivar. And then there is uh, the species which is uh, Rebecca fulgida, and that's a little taller. But other than that, they're, they're the same, reliable, you know. And I have down at the bottom, oxide sunflower burning hearts. We tried this to replace the, the, um, the orange cone flower, and I just thought it looked pretty artificial, so uh, we're not going to be growing that in this garden. We're going back to orange cone flower. Northern sea oats is part of that combination that I just showed you, but this is the picture of it. Um, I, this is really, really a beautiful visual plant for, for grass. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's got green spiky foliage. It's got great, great contrast. Uh, it has all these seasons of interest. It's got these green sig heads early. You can see them in the center sort of photo, and, but it's still spiky. And then it, uh, then it gets the seed heads and they, they turn uh, coppery and they, the first of all they're green and they turn brown and they turn coppery in the late fall. So uh, it's an extraordinary grass, it grows really easily. Um, and I was going to tell you something else. Oh, it will grow in part shade. Some of the plants will grow in part shade. I'm not mentioning that. Most of these are sun, full sun plants, but your um, plant list has that information on it. So you can look that up. This is the switchgrass area. Uh, and specifically, the cultivar that I want to mention is Cape Breeze. In the upper right, uh, upper left picture, you can see the species uh, switchgrass, uh, which is beautiful and airy. Great. It makes a foil for the rest of the plants in front of it. It's, it's like an English garden where you, uh, they, they say, put boxwood behind your garden because it'll pop your garden out, your flower garden out. 
Well, this switchgrass does the same thing um, in its own way. But at the edge of the garden on the right side is Cape Breeze, which looks exactly like the big tall grass, which is five, six feet high, but it is only about 30 inches high. So for a smaller garden, I really like that, that cultivar of switchgrass. Uh, on the right is switchgrass in front of another thing in that area, common milkweed. Um, I like common milk milkweed in this garden and practically every garden for one reason, it grows. It's very reliable. It has a great texture. It has desirable early June bloom, early bloom, which is in June. Pollinators love it, of course. It's a host for the monarch butterfly. It spreads vigorously by runners, okay? And these runners like to come up three, four feet, sometimes away from the parent plant. So, you know, what do we do about that? I was concerned in this garden, but what we do is we just yank the stalk, which is really easy to yank. And so far, it's the fourth year of the garden, and we have, and it's, it's easily controlled that way. So, so that's working, the common milkweed. Next, it common, oh, do I have it? There we go. Um, this is the common milkweed. I just wanted to show you this. It's part of the same plant combination. But uh, you can see the texture of it is really great. In front of it is that, in the center picture you can see uh, is that uh, switchgrass Cape Breeze. So that makes a beautiful facing down for this big milkweed. And that's the seed head at the bottom. Uh, this is the pink hair grass area which actually is right next to the Indian grass area. Um, I don't have a, big, a good picture of the pink hair grass, and I'm not sure we're gonna keep it, but I think we're still gonna keep it for now because it keeps getting better every year. It really needs a larger area. It's really a grass that wants full sun and dry, but I really wanted to try it. So um, it did better this last year in the garden, which was the third year. And so I want to keep it because if we can get it to grow, I mean, if, if it's going to grow, yeah, we're not going to do anything. Um, we'll give it a little more time. It grows beautifully with rattlesnake master, which is bottom center, spiky foliage and flowers. Uh, it has been reliable and is seeding around a bit. The basal foliage in the spring is like a yucca plant, but it's a little smaller foliage than a yucca plant. It's only about, I don't know, a foot high or so. Um, the deer like it in the spring. They like those leaves in the spring, but later on they don't like them. So I kind of spread, it's deer spread in the spring. Aster Lavis is the blue aster on the bottom right. Uh, it's beautiful late season, like all asters. It blooms in September, October. When everything else is fading, it is, uh, it, it's blooming beautifully. And it has been very reliable and it seeds around a bit. Um, it's popping into other places in the garden. And actually some of those places we like and we're leaving it there. It climbs up on other things sometimes. Pale purple coneflower is upper left slide. Um, it's very tall. It's like, I don't know, five feet high maybe. And it has tall, delicate and early bloom. Um, which means in this garden, June bloom, uh, June, July. Um, it's absolutely extraordinary looking when it's in bloom. After it blooms though, yeah, maybe in August, but after it blooms, it kind of falls to the ground, it kind of goes dilapidated. So it's really good to grow it in a taller plant. Now that purple, that the pink hair grass is not a taller plant, but next to this little area is the Indian grass. So I, we're gonna, let it grow more into the Indian grass um, so that it'll be covered up late season when it kind of goes, it, it kind of, it fell down. It falls down late season, it just kind of collapses. Indian grass is the late, is the last one. And this is a picture of the back of the garden from the, in, of the Indian grass area. Um, it fell over second year. Uh, it didn't stand upright, and it's a very tall grass. 
I mean, it looked okay in this garden, but last year, this last year, 2020, it did beautifully. It stayed upright. So I think it's just taking time also. I think that when these grasses mature, they get stiffer. We had a lot of rain this year, so it, it wasn't that. Rough goldenrod fireworks. Uh, a lot of goldenrods are too aggressive for a garden. This one is not. Uh, it gets to be three feet. Uh, four feet high, and it is absolutely stunning in um, in September. And it's not aggressive, very reliable, not aggressive. Wild senna. This is the bottom left. Um, the most exotic texture and flowers, and curious beans with seeds in them. Upright and so far very reliable. So these are the plants. I'll be ready for questions soon because what I want to tell you, show you now is just how the garden looked overall through the seasons during its second year. So this is August, second year. It's bigger, of course, it's bigger than first year. This is uh, in August as well, both sides of it. Uh, another picture in August, mid-September. It's getting, uh, it's getting that magical fall, you know, like fall apart fall look. It's really lovely. This is um, late September, mid October, late October, late October, late October. Now I have a very good camera. I have a Nikon, and it's kind of a low end professional one. And when I saw this picture and some of the others in the fall, I thought, you know, was it, was, is this brightening up this picture a bit? And the answer is no, it's not. The camera doesn't do that. It's very, very sensitive, but it doesn't really make things brighter than they really are. And if you look at some of the grays in the picture and the greens, this is not a brightened up picture. I remember the garden looking like that in, in the fall. And so it's it, the fall colors of this native meadow garden are quite spectacular actually. This is winter. Uh, I took this a few weeks ago and we had a snow. And uh, this is uh, um, from right, from left to right, upper corner is Echinacea seed head, uh, Northern Sea Oat seed, he seed head, and the picture in the upper right and the lower left are the Joe Pie weed. And then uh, on the bottom is a little um, dark eyed junco eating seeds beneath the Joe Pie weed. And this is the last picture, the meadow in winter, overall pictures. The snow picture was this year, and the other two were from last year. So everything goes brown, and quite honestly, by spring, all of that will be on the ground. It's messy in winter, but we leave it up over winter. And that's the presentation. So I think it might be time for questions.